that are now being used worldwide and hopefully helping um, address some of the future shortage issues. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about, and I think the most important, is the students. Uh, the, the learners all over the world who um, benefit from having access to a world quality education. And so I could spend hours um, reading student stories, but I'm just going to highlight a few that I think exemplify the impact that this would have on people's lives. Um, so this is Amanda from Dominica, who says that for Sarah it makes studying easier for me. I could sit at home and learn like I'm at school with no distractions, just with my headphones and my books. I can earn certificates without spending a night to get to my local school. It helps me a lot since my mom is in the hospital, and financially I can have a full work and school. This is Jose from the Philippines. He said, I took the class and experimented with genome science. The course was very, very challenging. I had to do some of the courses with a bunch of work. There's a different kind of commitment needed to take you on off courses, a stronger sense of personal integrity required. Then he said, I got into an interview for a job I really desired, and I mentioned that I would go from the course, and now I have a new job of value with genome research proposal. Tell me how that works. This one arrived about three months ago um, on one of the discussion forums. It's anonymous and it brought tears to all of our eyes. I'm just going to read it out. Um, two years ago, I felt incredibly miserable. I'm coming from a traditional family, so I married young all my life. I was either pregnant, breastfeeding, or both. I knew that I'm not good, but all I had in life was cleaning, feeding, cleaning, feeding, working part time. I wanted very much to study, but it was hard to find time. I started and left, started and left. I was deeply depressed. There was a moment when I tried to kill myself. But we humans are very tenacious of life, and I survived. At that time, I found Coursera, my first course called the Game Theory. It spelled the depression and desire to die once and forever. I feel happy and I enjoy my life and my family much more. In the last few years, I've taken about 40 courses. I'm addicted. Um, Coursera breathed life into me and gave me hope. And I know that when I keep grow up in 10 to 15 years, I will leave everything about Oxford. I dream about it. As Charles Dickens once said, suffering has been stronger than all their teaching. I've been bent and broken, but I hope into a better shape. The last one that I'd like to highlight is yet another type of access altogether. In this picture over here is Daniel, who's a 17-year-old boy, almost 18 now, who's severely autistic. He has a speaking vocabulary of 150 words. And, and, uh, and communicated by typing on an iPad. Um, nevertheless, Ben was the sole student in the University of Pennsylvania modern contemporary American poetry class, considered challenging even at 10, um, and has since taken multiple co-shared classes and succeeded in all of them. Um, ben was says, grew up from entering the longer physics and wrestling to the essay 3D rubric. So I do not only allow up to the people to learn, but actually even to be prepared and take a list of help. On the top right is a picture sent us by Daniel's father, with Daniel proudly displaying the certificate that he got from his Coursera classes. So having talked about some of those examples, let me talk a little bit about what these courses are like on the inside, um, what the learning experience is like. Um, so what we did here is instead of just trying to have this be static course material, we wanted to keep students engaged. And in order to do that, we made the course like a college experience. The course we give them a given day, and every week there is work that the student needs to do, and um, homework that they need to submit. The homework is graded, and the students who don't submit the homework don't get grades and don't pass the course. And you can see the impact of that by looking at the usage. Graph here with the x axis is time and the y axis is number of users on the site. And that heartbeat pattern that you see in the graph is every week, the day before the deadline, and everybody logs on to submit their homework. So I guess demonstrating that procrastination is not um, found only in our college campuses. And then at the end, there's a credential that I'll talk a little bit about in a few minutes. So what do these courses look like on a week by week basis? So first of all, there is the lectures, um, where the instructor um, really talks to you and explains the material, just like in a college class. So let's see what that looks like. These courses are not just given in college. This is the initiative model for the class. The instructor is lecturing right on the board, right on the pad. And then when the video hits the yellow notch, 
It's hard when really many students get asked the question. They answer the question, I'm waiting for whether they're right or wrong, and have the opportunity to try again. Um, this is the kind of question that we would like, um, that we often ask in a traditional face-to-face -face class. But when we do that, usually 80% of the students are still scribbling the last thing we said. And then there's that one smarty pants in the front row, um, usually always the same one, who answers the question before anyone else has even realized that a question had been asked. Here, every single student engages with the material, which is a much better learning experience. Now, of course, this is not where the meaningful learning happens. Students really need to actively work on the material in order to learn. And so um, that poses the question of how do you um, assess the homework of um, 50,000 students when you don't have 5,000 teaching assistants? And so in order to do that, uh, we have two methods. One is having computers do the grading. And fortunately, computers are not capable of grading more than just the usual multiple choice. There's also short answer grading, grading of computer programs and computer models, grading of math expression, and a variety of other things. Um, and it turns out that people can get really creative with all grading. So one of the uh, most uh, innovative examples that I have, there's many others, is this class from Georgia Tech by Professor Mike Schatz. Um, Mike teaches a class called Introductory Physics One Laboratory. Now, how do you teach a lab class when your students are spread all over the world and most of them don't have access to a lab? So Mike, had, Mike decided that the way to do that was to have the students do the experiment in their own environment with materials that are just there, like balls and tables and things like that. But then, if the students are doing the experiment in a way that, um, that you don't know what the experiment is, how do you know whether your answers are right or wrong? So what Mike did is he had the students um, film the experiment with their cell phones, as you can see in this picture, and then he used clever image processing software that he wrote, I don't know if you can see that, the really red dots, the, the red dots that track the ball, um, to compute things like, um, like velocities and accelerations and so on, so that he could then um, track, uh, so that he could then use that to grade uh, the student answers relative to the ground with the algorithm computer. So this is a very clever method that allows you to ask scale grading um, of lab work from students everywhere in the world. Now what's interesting is that Mike was here yesterday visiting our offices at Coursera, and he says that now that they can respect using the, the on-campus lab with the on-campus course so the students get such a kick, even the Georgia Tech students, from doing the lab on their own in the wild. And so basically it's caused them to rethink the way they teach and do labs even on the on-campus class. Now, the nice thing about, um, about computer grading is it's not only a scalability mechanism, it's also um, a pedagogical tool. So the reason for that is that the students get immediate feedback on the work that they do, as opposed to an um, on-campus class where it can sometimes take, take three or four weeks before they get the graded homework back. And that immediate feedback basically turns the interaction into something that's only for the beginning. Students who don't get it's the first time have the incentive to resubmit and try again. And we can see that in this graph over here, where the further away the student goes from a perfect score, which is the x-axis, the more likely they are to resubmit the work and have another try. Um, and that's the kind of behavior that you would hope for because it means the weaker students have a better learning experience. Now, of course, the question is, does resubmitting actually improve their overall performance in the class, or are they just randomly guessing? And so I can show some pretty detailed analytics on that, but for the moment I just gave a high-level summary, which is that the students who engage in this, what we call mastery-based learning, do better not only in the assignment that they got for these students, but also in the final exam. The second scalability mechanism that uh, for at scale grading that we put in is intended to do with the kind of open-ended work that um, students uh, that, that exists in so many classes in the humanities and the social sciences and even in science and engineering where you need to um, submit open-ended essay questions, critiques, designs, and so on and so forth. Here, for example, is, um, is a kind of a future training career, if you like, um, how do you design a lesson plan? So it is, um, so to address the you put in place a mechanism called peer grading where the instructor designs what's called a grading rubric. Um, which tells students how to grade the work of their peers. 
the students um, apply that rubric to the work of five of their fellow students. Um, and then each of them in turn gets feedback from five people. Um, and we find that, um, we find several things about this. First of all, we find that if the grading rubric is well designed, as for example, an analysis done in the strengths of sociology class, then there's a very strong correlation between the score that would have been assigned by PA, on the X axis here, and the score that was assigned by the peer grading process, the Y axis. So you can see that's a very strong correlation, um, but it, I think, commensurate with what the teaching systems would do if they were using the same rubric. The second thing we find is that um, students and building talks but this is um, that the peer grading process is a remarkably valuable um, um, pedagogical experience for them because it forces them to learn how to think critically about um, about a piece of work, what makes it good versus bad, and they are then in most classes required to apply the same rubric to their own work, having seen the work of five other people as salvation, and that forces them to critically think about what they might have done better so that they can do better next time. The final um, aspect of peer grading is that really does open the door to a very broad range of classes that you wouldn't think can be done at no scale. So here, for example, the design class from Penn, which is really an eight-week project class, where each week the students submitted a successively improved version of their project and got feedback from five of their peers. So by the end of the course, they've gotten um, 40 pieces of feedback, and some of them came up with projects that use top tier thousands or as good as anything that we've gotten in the class. And let me give just one final example of um, a really innovative application uh, of peer grading in one that's been particularly impactful. Our single largest um, MOOC ever is um, this course by Scott Files from Wesleyan College. Wesleyan is a liberal art college. Um, the instructor typically teaches a class of 12 to 15 people in his on-campus course. In his um, MOOC, he has 250,000 students, the largest one ever offered. His final project in the class was uh, what he called the Day of Compassion. The students were supposed to um, move 24 hours as compassionately as possible, analyze the experience using the tools that they lived in class. 700 students received a perfect score on the assignment by the peer grading process. And then they voted on these 700 assignments to see which of them got the grand prize, which is an expense paid trip to Stanford to so maybe Dalai Lama. So let me tell you about that one final project, but remember, there's 699 others um, uh, who also were of comparable, probably almost comparable quality. The grand winner is this woman called Dinesh Jindal, who was a physician in New Delhi, who basically decided she wanted to study about the problem of sexual violence in India. So she visited a school of 2,000 girls from their socioeconomic status, um, taught them about sexual violence, inappropriate touching, and covered multiple cases of abuse, and now is providing pro bono consulting to those students um, in order to help them overcome their experience. And this is just one project out of several hundred um, that arose from this class of this one professor at Wesleyan College, who usually teaches college students. Um, peer learning leads naturally to the collective issue of community. Uh, one of the things that distinguishes these courses from a traditional online experience or traditional distance learning experience is the richness of the community that, um, that surrounds the course material. So unlike a traditional hub and spoke model where the instructor answered all of the questions and most of the questions by the students, um, here because of the size of the community, the students naturally need to answer the questions posed by their fellow students. And so effectively you have a model that looks like peer teaching. A student asks a question, another student jumps in and helps explain it to them, giving rise to pedagogical benefit for both the student who's getting the explanation and the one who's figuring out how to explain the material to somebody else. Um, now, not only is this a very large community, it's also a very rich one. Here, for example, is a map of the location of students in one of our courses, um, the Synapses, Neurons, and Brains course from the University of Jerusalem. And you can see a very broad worldwide distribution of students. Um, and this is particularly nice because when you have um, such uh, a rich network of students, you get a very broad diversity of perspectives. 
which is, um, I think, particularly valuable in contextualized forces like in sociology, sustainability, or even medicine, where you're likely to get very different answers from a student who lives in Bangladesh versus one who lives in Nigeria. Now, communities are not only virtual. Um, it turns out that people really want and value face-to-face -face interaction. And so students have naturally accommodated into thousands of communities around the world that meet up once a week to talk about the course materials and, um, and help each other over the hard bit. So I'm going to highlight one of those communities which inspired one of our, um, one of our ongoing projects. This is a community in Ohio of um, people who are not among life's most fortunate. These are primarily older women from uh, minority backgrounds who um, only one of whom had a college education, all of whom were unemployed or working in low-paying um, jobs. They got together uh, under the supervision of a facilitator who um, is the woman standing on the top left. Her name is Sharon Watkins. They took the class to take, the Common Entrepreneurship class from the University of Virginia Business School, which is one of the top in the US. Um, and they took the class together. Ten of them enrolled in the class, nine of them completed, and six um, passed an MBA level finally that. Remember, these are not college-educated people. Um, so this really demonstrates, I think, the value of having high-quality course materials combined with, um, with a strong face-to-face -face community. So the markers that more broadly, um, in October, at the end of October, we announced this, this project called Learn Form, which is a global network um, of, of sites around the world where students get together um, in protected environments with a facilitator to learn together. So this is a network of our first set of learning hubs, most of which are U.S. entities around the world and facilitated by U.S. entity personnel. These are all pro bono, um, and we're now putting in place um, many more additional learning hubs around the world. Um, so the final part of the course experience is the certificate that one gets at the end. And so let me talk a little bit about that credential because I think it's, it's a new form of credential for the 21st century. Uh, we, put in, we put this in place at the beginning of 2013, so just about a year ago, um, where students who um, in, the first, uh, in the first few weeks of the course decided they want to take a core credential, which was to just for learning, can, um, can uh, involve in what we call the signature class, which is an identity verified uh, mechanism. When students do that, their identity is verified by comparing their webcam photo to a picture ID, and when that happens, um, they also, they, we also create a biometric profile for them that in our particular case uses keystrokes as sort of a visual signature, if you will. And when students have that, we can then identify them every time they log into the platform, knowing that they're the ones doing on learning. So at the end, we can give them a much more meaningful certificate, as you see on the top right. And there are many students who are actually using the certificate um, for getting jobs and often in applications to colleges, for example. Now, this notion of the, of the credential also gives us the ability to address one of the critiques that's typically levied in the media um, around the issue of MOOCs, which is the commonly um, repeated phrase is that MOOCs must not be a great educational experience because only 5% of the students who um, enroll for MOOCs actually complete it. Now, that factually happens to be true. Um, what I think people neglect to understand is that most people who apply for, who's enrolled for MOOC have absolutely no intent to complete it. They're just clicking enroll because they feel like understanding something about the material or even just knowing what it's about. So a much better notion of retention can be obtained by looking at the population who are actually in it to complete the course. So if you look at that in the context of this um, verified certificate or signature trap, so coming back to the number, about 5% of the people who enroll complete. People who are in the signature trap, um, about 63% of them complete the course. If you further want to look at the people who um, are, um, as, as they enroll in the class, say that they're highly committed to completing the course, the numbers, again, are about 60-some percent, and if they also put in that extra, little bit of extra skin in the game uh, by, um, by uh, in, in running in this verified certificate program and paying the fifty dollars that it costs, the numbers go close to the eighty-eight percent. And so, it really is more of a question of intent um, to complete the course. 
So the final part of this talk, um, very briefly, is how does this help us improve learning? And there's really two different half parts of this. The first is improving learning in the online experience, and the second is improving learning in face-to-face -face classes. So in the online experience, one of the things that we can do is actually um, use the data that we get from this online platform to understand what's working and what's not, and to help fix it. And this is because um, the fact that the students are doing work in this online platform, which is fully instrumented, gives us a very detailed visibility into whether students are spending time on task, what they're submitting, whether they're submitting the long answer and the right answer. Um, everything is, uh, is instrumented and recorded. And it's recorded at the scale of tens of thousands of students, which gives us enough data to actually make um, reasonable conclusions. So here's one such example. Um, this is the distribution of wrong answers in one of um, my colleague Andrew's machine learning exercises. Each of the little crosses is a one-off wrong answer. But the big crosses, for example, the one at the top left, is where 2,000 students make the exact same mistake. Now, if two students in a class of 100 make the same mistake, you've never noticed, well, with 2,000, it's kind of hard to ignore. And so Andrew and Steve went in, figured out the basis for the misconception, and now every time a student's answer falls into that bucket, they don't just get a generic error message, they get one that's tailored for the mistake that they made so that they can do better next time. So that's um, improvement that you can do in the purely online world. What about um, students in our own face-to-face -face classes? So this is one of my favorite quotes. It's from 19th century educator Edwin Slauson, who said that college is a place where professors left your notes go straight to the students left your notes without passing through the brains of either. <laughs> Probably um, a somewhat damning description of the college education process, but maybe not entirely unwarranted when you see this picture at the bottom left. So how can we do better? Well, maybe what we ought to do is let computers do what they're good at, which is deliver content and help students practice the basic skills um, using high-quality online content. And then in the in-class experience, with a live instructor, do things that people are good at, like active learning, problem solving, group work, um, critiques, role playing, all sorts of other things that are much better done in a face-to-face -face setting. Um, and providing those students who need the extra attention with the attention that they need. So it turns out that this is actually um, consistently uh, providing better educational outcomes to students. This is a pretty typical result. It's from the University of Wisconsin at Madison, but there's um, multiple other studies that show the exact same effects. If you compare traditional education to this blended learning model, um, you basically um, see that the students at the bottom left, the, the students at the bottom of the distribution move up to the top and move up to the normal range and pass through past the courses. So, um, to summarize, um, where next? I think the important component of this is the following picture, which is produced by one of our instructors called Christian Sirwish, um, who taught an operations management class for first year up. He argues and his final lecture is a um, case study of course there are some operations management perspective. He argues that education is a trade-off along the Pareto optimal curve, where we trade off faculty productivity, the number of students talk per hour, with students in the outcome. So a large depth of all, great productivity, 300 students can be taught at once, so so learning outcomes. Office hours, individual instructor, great learning outcomes, terrible productivity. The argument that MOOCs give us a new Pareto optimal frontier, and it's up to us on how to use it. You can take a large lecture hall quality of instruction and offer it to students, to hundreds of thousands of students around the world. It might not be the best educational experience, but it's certainly, uh, but it's certainly not a terrible one. Um, you can therefore greatly increase access and availability. Or you can take the same amount of work that professors currently um, for, uh, spend on um, material preparation and delivery and on grading, and use that instead for blended learning experience to improve student learning outcomes. And so depending on what we're trying to achieve and which population, we can use this curve any way that we want. And so the final thing I wanted to just, um, to just point out, um, because I think it's um, coming back to the beginning of the talk, is, um, is the implication of this. Um, right now, uh, of our students, only 30% are in the United States, and 40% are in the developing world. Um, in many of those countries, 
um, the educational offerings are very poor and for many students entirely unavailable because there is just insufficient capacity there for um, offering education to many people who want it. And so if we want to create educational opportunities for all those people within a reasonably short time frame, there are not very many options available to us because there's just some insufficiency, not only of educational institutions, which one can always build, but more importantly of qualified instructors. And so this is really um, a way for us to address those educational shortages and hopefully um, turn education into something that is available only to a privileged few, so that it's available to everyone. Thank you.